It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this event organized by, on the occasion of launching Master of City Design program within the College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs. Our various programs have been providing for over 40 years important input um, in developing professionals who manage, administer, and plan our cities. The design itself provides an important link to all those as all our actions are spatially or locationally grounded, whether in terms of built environment, physical infrastructure, or communities themselves, um, developed or affected by decisions, decisions made by many local actors um, in the city, individuals, organizations across sectors, and the governance processes as well. Um, this new program would like to make a unique and positive contribution to city building and urban development. And one way of asserting its impact is opening constructive dialogues, dialogues on what we want to achieve for our cities, our residents, and our environment, current environment and future environment. Conversations, conserva uh, conversations such as the one today are crucial for ensuring we understand our own purposes uh, and we exchange critical and innovative perspectives and views on how to design and develop our cities. With this, I'd like to welcome you all and to uh, pass on to our program director, Sanjeev Vidyarthi, who will introduce uh, our invited speakers, conversants, and distinguished guests. So welcome everyone, and I'll pass on to our MC. Thank you. Thank you, Zalitza. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out. Uh, it's, a, um, it's a pleasure to, to introduce um, Dr. Emily Gallen, Professor of Urbanism at University of Chicago, um, and Dr. Asim Anand, Chair of Urban Design at Cardiff University, UK. Um, as Doris Samoy mentioned, both urban planning and city design are, are new disciplines. They are sort of, you know, both of them sort of arose with, with the advent of the industrial cities like Chicago and New York in the late 19th century. Urban design, uh, urban planning as a, as, a, as a discipline sort of starts first time in the early 20th century as we know. So it's, it's sort of a new kid on the block when compared to older disciplines like architecture or civil engineering that date back hundreds of years. City design is even new, 1960s is the first time uh, our discipline is formed. So it's still, you know, whether it's a profession, whether it is, it is a, a discipline or it is it is still something new that needs to be defined more clearly. Uh, both the speakers for today um, have worked on both sides of fences. Both of them have practiced as professionals. Um, uh, Emily started off as, as a professional planner, working, working at the city level for, for several years before she did a PhD, um, and is one of the most prolific writers within the field of urban design. I don't want to go over the long list of publications. Google always helps uh, <laughs> save a time. But please Google every talent, and you would come up on uh, thousands of citations within, within the field. Uh, Dr. Asim Inam is, is both a scholar and a practitioner um, who has worked in the field of urban design in different parts of the world, and is, has again published um, uh, on, in this field um, substantially. So um, without further ado, uh, let me explain the format of this talk. This is organized as a conversation, so I would invite uh, Emily and Asim to stand very clearly in less than two minutes their, their state, their position on the table. What do they think is the future of cities and what do they think is the future role of design in shaping cities. Once they have uh, stated their, their positions, um, then we would have about a 30 minute free flowing conversations between three of us with me moderating and then we would open it up for questions and discussion with the audience. Um, so over to Ed. Okay. So two minutes on the future of the city, <laughs> future of urban design. I like it. Okay. It's a nice challenge. Um, I think this is super exciting, this new degree in um, city design at UIC. I'm super supportive. Um, I, I really hope it succeeds. Uh, we don't have anything like it at the University of Chicago, that's for sure. Um, so just a couple of quick points. Um, the future of cities, I guess a point I want to make is um, I think we have to, I would like to separate out my fear about the future of the city and my aspiration about the future of the city. My fear is 
that it's going to be like the Jetsons and we're going to have cities of gleaming skyscrapers and it's all going to look like Singapore and you know it's um, it's not going to be very human um, and uh, that's my fear uh, my aspiration is pretty simple um, I want our cities to be walkable and dense and diverse and transit served and bike oriented and um, very much pedestrian scale um, all that old school, um, I'm okay with that. I think um, with this sort of, I guess my aspiration then is, is pretty um, humble. Um, I don't have, um, you know, there's sort of good news, bad news with that aspiration. Um, the bad news, the good news is that a lot of people, I think, are on board with that basic ideal of walkable, diverse cities and um, if it sounds like new urbanism it kind of is um, very Jane Jacobs kind of stuff I, I personally haven't moved on from that basic vision of things um, so the good news is that's you know it's infiltrated a lot of different domains about the city the bad news is is that we're sort of loving it to death and too many people want that transit served walkable diverse urbanism um, and uh, it's becoming out of reach for too many people. So that's our basic, to me, that is the fundamental issue before us right now in Chicago. Um, and uh, it takes a, a design response and it takes a policy response and we need to have both of those things in play. All right. Thanks, Emily. Over to you, Asim. Really delightful to be in Chicago. Uh, I've been to Chicago many times, the city I love. I've always had good friends here. I've studied Chicago quite a bit, I've studied the history of Chicago, so it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the future of city design. And this is a common question that you see, whether you call it what is urban design, what is urbanism, uh, what is city design. And as you can tell, these are at least nine different ways of answering that question. So one way is to ask that question, try to define it in a single line as if that will give, give us all the answers. So I'm claiming something else, we go to the next slide. I think you can ask very much more powerful questions. So you'll see two differences between the first question, what is city design, to what can urbanism be? First of all, whenever you say something, what is, you immediately are talking about much more about the past and present, which is much more of the status quo. You want to rethink how we do things, you want to improve them radically. And so this is much more future oriented. It's much more about learning from the past. And of course taking what works, but also taking our new knowledge and improving it. And so sort of saying what is, what can it be, is there's no magical definition or answer out there. It's up to us to redefine what it can be through the programs like the Master of City Design program, through our practices, through our research, to constantly reflect on that. So, uh, the advantage of this question is it's future oriented, it embraces plurality, it can have multiple answers, it's okay to have more than one answer to a good question. But what I'm arguing for is a shift in attitude. So the traditional notion of urban design, uh, and you know, even Kevin Lynch used the word city design, because you want to get away from urban design, which has been, it's changing now for the better, but it has long been architecture at a larger scale. And even the 1950s and 60s, when uh, Jose Luis said the dean at Harvard was kind of first codified urban design, it was actually a particular kind of post World War II capitalist development. And so it's a very particular kind of thing. I think we need to much more have a much broader notion of what it can be. And the final point is, which I think comes back to what we are trying to do here at University of Illinois in Chicago, is the possibility of being mentioned. It's kind of, I think it's always good to ask powerful questions and rethink things. So this has a quick example. Uh, as Sanjeev said, I, I practice and I teach. Uh, so actually I call myself an activist scholar practitioner. Why the word activist is I'm constantly rethinking about the system. Uh, and we can talk about it in discussion. I think it's more than about projects. And I think I'm sure I know Emily's work very well. It's about the system of city design that needs to be rethought. So this is a quick example of a project we did in Los Angeles. Uh, this is very often uh, what is shown as emblematic of city design, these wonderful renderings of what 
a city or a neighborhood can be. But really, with the heart and soul of urban design, uh, things like this. Uh, I call it spectacular mundane. Sometimes it's the very <laughs> unsexy things that make urban design happen. Yeah, the beautiful renderings and drawings are wonderful. They're visionary. They're inspiring. But this is a legal document that will ensure that the vision of the community stays for the next uh, 20 years or so. And so it defines zones and uses and all kinds of things. It's not a typical zoning plan. It's, uh, Emily knows this very well. It's kind of a home based codes. Uh, but it codifies and it puts in place. So it's not like every time there's a new mayor based on her or his whims, things change here and there. But there's a, the community's vision is codified. Thanks. So just two things I'm going to highlight. I'm obviously not going to go into the plan. Uh, one is we were, uh, one of the reasons our firm, Mool and Polyzoides in uh, Los Angeles was selected is we do things in a very transparent and democratic way. That's the word I want to use, not community participation, not transparency, but how do you do city design in a very de truly democratic way. It's not easy, it's messy, it takes time, it's complicated, but we have to do it. If we believe in democracy, we have to do that, but there's no other choice. So we were selected for that. And you see some of the images on the top left and bottom left. Uh, everything was very open. Decisions were made open. It wasn't preparing pretty drawings, showing them to people, saying, oh, do you like them, do you don't like them? No, they were part of the decision-making process. And so what we found, one of the greatest legacies of this project was, of course, the proposal and the plans were creating this political constituency for urbanism. That now, because of this process, uh, those who were involved in the process were much were, were holding their elected representatives, the council, the planning commission, the mayor, accountable for having higher standards of design and development, which is one of the goals of the project. The second two on the right, no, before that, the image on the uh, image on the upper right and lower right, is one of the things we, we came up with working with the residents was one of the most significant issue they had was a lack of parking. And we found that time and again, I worked all over the US, and almost everywhere we go, they said there's not enough parking. But almost everywhere we go, there's actually too much parking. So do you know what explains that? When the people say, oh, not enough parking, not enough parking, but when you do an actual count, there's actually too much parking is being underutilized. The reason is that people want to park when and where they want. So for example, Christmas shopping, everybody wants to park near the entrance to the shopping mall or the store at the same time. You can't have a thousand parking spaces at the entrance. So it's not about designing parking, it's about designing parking management systems, which is sort of what we did. But more than that, what we did was we took this issue of not enough parking and said, how can we make it now a pedestrian oriented place? So it's not just simplistic, oh, let's do more parking. So for example, I won't go into the details of the diagram, we created new parking, we proposed new parking structures where people have, would have to walk to those parking garages and walk past the local small businesses. So how do you use parking strategically to actually benefit not necessarily the large franchise, you know, uh, corporate owned businesses, but the small unique businesses that they come for and how do you place them in design so they walk past them. Okay, last slide. So, just some quick lessons about from this uh, project. I call it beyond practice. What I'm trying to say is, I think one of the potential of city design is to look beyond it as only professional practice. It has to be, and I call it urbanism as creative political act, and I'll explain that in a few ways. One is, as you see in the top point, engaging with everyday politics of the city, uh, including especially working with communities. Second is this kind of fundamental question which is beneath the surface. Who has the power to actually make urbanism happen or not happen? And those of you in practice know that also happens quite often. You might have the best ideas and a great project, but something happens and blocks it. Third is the point about parking, taking problems and flipping them around by marrying physical with non-physical. So what we came up with was a design for parking management system, not just tons of new parking. And the uh, fourth and final point is to make a real difference, we have to acknowledge the fundamentally political nature of urbanism, which I'll be happy to discuss later.
I have nothing else. Uh, that's it. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, now, uh, thinking of designing uh, cities, one would usually not think of, of designing a parking structure and that the system for parking that places. Emily, do you want to respond to that? Uh, well, only to say that I agree <laughs> um, about the parking point. But I, I like the point that, um, you know, urban design, when it's part of urban planning, which is, you know, my perspective certainly, um, it does kind of come down to the devil being in the details and very seemingly mundane things matter a lot. Um, to me, there's social justice in the width of a sidewalk. Um, and these sort of non-sexy things about urban design from an urban planning perspective, I don't know that that sits well with architects and architecture, which is craving originality, craving innovation, constantly being told that they have to come up with the next best thing that nobody else has done. And urban, I'm getting a little off topic here, but urban design in, a, in an urban planning sense is often about finding the commonalities and these sort of rooted universals. Um, the rooted universals to my mind is a very important point, see here. Uh, we sort of see it um, in, in different contexts. So uh, post-war period is a good example of this, when we thought we had some universals in place, like modernism, or as Bob Rubin uh, uh, pointed out, in terms of de-densifying the city, which we realize has become an issue today. So from that perspective, is the, is the dense pedestrian, uh, walkable, makes use, green, and sustainable, uh, which we think of as a universal today. Do you think that as valid in different parts of the world? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I would say uh, we have to be a little bit careful. Uh, whenever we use the word universal, I would say according to whom? Who decides it's universal? And it's usually the people in power. And so, yes, for example, I think we can mostly agree we want a more sustainable world, but that means different things in different places. So I always find it interesting because I work a lot in Brazil and India and Mexico and other places. When they get lectured by people coming from New York or Chicago or London or Paris about sustainability, it's been shown again and again that their ecological footprint has always been much smaller than the people living in North America or Europe. So it's, you have to be a little careful lecturing people who actually live quite more sustainably, maybe not in the way we think. Uh, so I think the approach, and I think uh, this also matches what Emily is saying, is to have a set of principles which can then be translated in different ways in different settings. So like the principle of sustainability or the principle of democratic design might mean different things. For example, I don't know what it would mean I don't know if there's somebody from the Middle East here, so I'll become the Middle East. Uh, Dubai is not a democracy. It's run by a sheikh. So how would you do community engagement there? I'm not sure. They don't even pretend to be a democracy. So that principle of democratic design and community engagement would be very different in that setting. That's one of the things I, I meant when I said you have to understand that Urbanism happens in a political context, happens within political economic systems. It doesn't happen in a vacuum where you go around the world doing cookie cutter, even well-meaning or pretty cookie cutter projects. You have to understand how those principles translate into very specific cultural and political contexts. Thanks, um, Emily. Uh, this I want to go back to the to the idea of universal principles from the perspective of movements. We know and, and this is. Uh, three or one for neighborhoods um, um, that we have sort of held on to the idea within especially the, the modernistic plan, planning paradigm of using principles in, in a certain way and no wonder our cities across the world and especially, especially in this country tend to look the same and there is that question of, of identity and diversity and local context that Asim pointed out from your perspective how do you see that playing out? The use of principles. Um, so the minute I said that word universal, I regretted it because I know that that is that's a hot button kind of a word. Um, it sounds very top down. What I found really heartening is um, 
certain principles about urbanism that I personally hold dear, when you throw open the urban design process in a community, people land on certain things all the time. They want walkability, they want pedestrian access, they want walkable streets and wide sidewalks, they want, they even want diversity a lot of times. So these are things um, that, that constantly bubble up and I find that um, incredibly heartening because obviously if you don't have the community wanting to have these things, then they're just a set of principles that just exist in, in the abstract. Now the new urbanists um, have gotten into a lot of trouble over the years with their very explicit statement of, they have a charter. Here are our 27 principles, bam, all laid out. And um, a lot of, I was at a talk recently about that, about that charter book and those 27 principles. And people, some people react really badly to that idea that it's even possible to write all of that down. They find that really um, too top down and, and disarming and ingenuous and all kinds of nasty things. But the point is, that to kind of have a stake in the sand and just say, here's where we're trying to go. And there's multiple processes to get there. There's even multiple translations of what those principles might look like on the ground um, when you actually you know, put them in, in built form. Um, but I think I, I couldn't go on as an urban designer without having those principles to, to orient my, to clarify my thinking. That's one definition of urban design, isn't it? To make the complex clear. So it's, it's those principles are about clarifying. Um, I see it from a process point of view, the way design happens, and you talk about the political side of it. How do you see the utility of these principles in shaping the process while design? Yeah, I think that's one of the real potentials of, you know, uh, you're using different terms, urban design, street design, urbanism. I think you're referring to the same thing that you also have to design the process. Uh, as we all know, a lot of voices get left out, get drowned out, are not even invited, are not given a chance to speak. So I think uh, I think we have to not just design places and design projects, we have to design processes. The good news is there's some fantastic experiments happening around all of this, and they have been happening for a long time, and you have to recognize them. They're, they may be not in mainstream design, so we have to be a little careful. They may be what we might think at the fringe or whatever, but I think they should be at the heart of it. So I think designing processes is a huge creative opportunity, in a, especially in a democratic setting, where different voices get heard. It's, it is messy and complicated. That's the thing I think people don't want to deal, or we have a hard time dealing with this. Democracy is complicated, but it's, it's a wonderful system. It has a lot of potential. And you know, democracy is a work in progress. And I think one of the things we can strengthen democracy, especially at the local level, city level, at the neighborhood level, by helping design these processes. I mean, uh, I showed you a little bit, but uh, I know a lot of us have done that in many different ways, and we're constantly learning how to improve that. But I think, yeah, so within a, for me, that's also political, is how decisions are made is a political process. I think we have to acknowledge that and engage with them. But historically, the way this, this profession has moved forward, right? we know it's, it's based on grand ideas, usually. That's how humans have made progress. Um, the post-war suburb, right? that was uh, created a very clear image, uh, created a political constituency, uh, backers sort of reflected back in, in zoning. So too much of the political dynamic paying attention to incremental small scale stuff, are we losing that basic human impulse that gets driven by these grand ideas moving the humanity forward? Could climate change, the more recent IPCC report that sort of talks about cities and land use as two of the major factors that could that could shift the, the attention of policy makers and people in general uh, to create better cities? Well, this is, ex it's a good question because it's exactly where urban design is so needed to have the vocabulary of design to have the skills to translate 
things like abstract ideas like sustainability and resilience into actual built form and what, what does that mean for life in the city and for our experience of places. Um, and so, you know, just putting in another plug for your program here, absolutely critical that planners have those tools and techniques and design, ability to design the process to, um, to translate those larger ideas. Um, and I think that that is actually not as well developed as we would hope. Um, now the big, the big ideas we used to have in the City Beautiful movement and Robert Moses and all kinds of top-down um, strategies, we don't want to really go back there, although there is a stream of yeah. thought out there that says, bring back the benevolent dictator who can actually get shit done because we're not, you know, effectuating change the way we need to be. Um, and these sort of tactical urbanist bottom-up approaches are just little drops in the bucket and we're not really getting where we need to be. I don't happen to um, necessarily agree with that, but I, I think, again, having the tools of the, of the trade, of even the vocabulary and the training to translate those ideas is key. I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive. So I'll take your first point about are we losing the brand vision? So you know, one of the things we study in the history of urbanism is Paris and House Prince Paris. That was a very top-down place. So does that mean it's we cannot appreciate its beauty? Um, I have some trouble with that because, for example, you know, as we learn more, I think our sensibilities should change. So for example, we you know the White House was built by slaves. The US Capitol was built by slaves. For me, that's part of assessing that place. Is it just an object? No, it's not. It's created in a certain way. That bothers me. I don't think like in, when you get to <coughs> historic places, so in one of the, uh, the famous Chicago plan by Daniel Burnham, which was basically a bunch of rich white businessmen getting together and deciding what's good for everybody. Is that what we want? I mean, it looks very nice. Uh, a counter example is if you've been to Canberra in uh, Australia, which is the capital of Australia, it was actually done by uh, an American border, Burley Griffin. Beautiful kind of city, beautiful movement plan. But you go there to the city and it's dead. It's got these gorgeous vistas and tree line avenues, but it doesn't have a light, it doesn't have. So I'm not so impressed by grand visions anymore, as you learn. And there's a different kind of grand vision. The kind of grand vision which motivates me is the civil rights movement in the US, which did not come from top down. Or the independence movement in India in the 19, it was over a period of 50 years, which is probably the largest uh, peaceful non-violent revolution in the history of the world. It was not a bunch of people saying, oh yeah, this is what we're gonna do. Uh, or the women's rights movements, the suffragette movement, if, uh, there were a lot of sacrifices made. So I think you have to look outside design, I think you're getting my drift, to real historical change. If that's the kind of change I think is what we're talking about in cities. That's what inspires me and not necessarily the visions of Hausman or the master plan, which might look good on paper, but it should leave out a lot of things <coughs> that have to be desired. So, um, I've quickly gone to summarize where we have reached so far. Right? Cities are apparently important. Um, uh, political democracy seems to be the case to, to sort of make it more sustainable. Principles matter, but it's not the grand vision that's in play here. Um, and, and perhaps more importantly, urban design seems to be in the perspective of the two, and this is not a plug, but um, it seems to be more closely aligned to planning from the perspective of the two, two um, speakers. Than, than architecture or, or pretty buildings. Um, we have an option, we can carry on with this or we can open it for questions. Can I have a show of hands, just to sort of gauge an interest, how many people might be interested in asking a question at this point in time? Oh, come on. All right, so let's let's open it for questions. Charlie, you go first. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> I've been gone and then you put me on the spot. <laughs> Question to me is think of you both have been teachers and done work, so think we're in a 
studio class in the new MCD program. You guys are coming down the south. Mic. And the students are there, and you're trying to say, help us understand how would we do urban design differently. Uh, Asim was talking earlier, it's not architecture big. It's not just we're going to build the city as like a building. No, it's not that. Uh, you did a little bit of scene with your case and the parking story, but I really find to think methodologically, how would I as a student learn from you how to do this differently? So I don't just draw, or I'm just not a social scientist telling people there's inequalities here and it's doing it. Uh, how do you weave together the activity from the social movement, the relationships of that, with the discipline of thinking about spatial relationships in an awkward way, in an unfamiliar Way, or how do you take the person who's very sophisticated visually and in design to think about the complex business of social relationships and how they change over the time? Uh, an example might be helpful, or a story or something. I'm not really trying to do an intellectual challenge. I'm really trying to give you to think as a teacher. You probably have done this in you think of the time where you can learn from it. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent point because I think uh, the university is the best place for doing exactly what you're saying, is finding new and better ways of learning about cities, of doing design. Uh, and the good news is, is, so that's one. The second is, I think we have to think of them as experiments, that we don't have to have the answers for everything. And the good news there is there's been actually experiments going on about this for a long time in different universities all over the world. So I can talk a little bit about my colleagues and I, and it's definitely a team effort, it's not me, it's a bunch of us that we learn from each other, we learn from the students. Uh, so one of the things is, you know, uh, as you know, a lot of urban design projects have been experiments on people. Uh, urban renewal is a good example. But how do you work with people? So there are like research methods like participatory action research, which you can bring into studio and design, where you work with the residents. And uh, we, have a, we have an exercise called helping a community discover itself. So how do you work with them to kind of analyze their own neighborhood, uh, do mapping exercises, do photography, and this has, there are experiments in this which need to be codified, and what emerges out of that? So two things I'm saying is one is, what kinds of analytical methods help us work with communities, not things, one is, what kinds of analytical methods help us work with communities, not on them, and so that, they are at the forefront, but in partnership with us, we are also not just passive in the background, we are working actually with them. The second thing that comes is what emerges out of it. So rather than doing studios with the predetermined ideas, this is the project no matter what happens. What if you had a more open-ended studio where you decide what to do based on what you find? So the solution doesn't always precede the problem finding, but it comes out of that. Uh, and we've done that, uh, you know, again, this, there's always room for improvement, uh, but quite successfully in different areas. And what are we actually uh, trying to do? So for example, right now I can give an example. We are doing a studio on anti-gentrification design strategies. And the idea there is instead of waiting after it's too late and bemoaning gentrification, uh, what do we do now, what do we do now, how do we see that gentrification is starting to happen. Well, that's an analytical method that even as practitioners you, we need to learn. And there's a lot of good research. So that, again, you don't have to reinvent everything coming out of sociology, anthropology, economics, etc. How can we use those methods to look at indicators that, oh, gentrification is about to happen? And then from a design perspective, what are strategies to deal with that? And so one thing is very clear, you can't just design your way out of it in a traditional sense. You have to think about things like finance, land, not, not land use as much as land ownership, uh, public policies, things like that. So this is that kind of integrative approach that I think Charlie you were talking about earlier, is uh, you know, when, especially when you have students working in teams, they can look at these different things and work together. So those are some of the ways that you can do what you're saying. So I had you. That's, yeah, yeah. A simple question. Could you apply what you've just said to Chicago? We went through 22 years of the daily administration and eight years of the manual administration. I think they've had two different emphasis on how to approach this topic. Mayor Daly 
relied on his experience of living in Chicago his entire life. No, I'm not so sure. I mean, he says he's from Chicago, but he was born in the suburbs. Um, I'll stop there before I get into too much trouble. <laughs> and just get a reaction. So the question is, how do their approaches? Well, how would you evaluate how, evaluate how they did? And then how would you apply what you're saying to improve on that? OK, well, I don't know much about daily, but um, uh, Emmanuel, uh, well, I've been super disappointed, I have to say, with the um, ability of neighborhoods to really have a voice in what happens to them. And since we're talking about urban design here, I think um, there is a real lack of uh, having design be the mechanism of engagement, the translation between what neighborhoods want and um, you know what actually happens at City Hall. And I, just a really um, anecdotal um, uh, experience that I had was I used to live in Printers Row, and our alder woman said, "We're going to have a we're going to do a neighborhood plan for um, Printers Row." And uh, Janet, I know you live in Printers Row too. I don't know if you were at this meeting, but all kinds of people came to the meeting, and somebody walks in and says. Let's just have a conversation about what needs to happen in this neighborhood. There was no map. There was no visual whatsoever. There was no understanding about trade-offs that need to happen. So people, and these are very basic urban design kind of skills to bring to the table. Um, so I was super disappointed in the kind of missed opportunity there. And, and maybe that goes on all over Chicago. I've been to a few of these neighborhood meetings. Now I live in Lincoln Park and I've been to one. It was the same kind of story. There's no design-specific conversation going on. It's um, there's a lot of platitudes and there's a lot of high-order thinking and a lot of frustration with the inability to translate what neighborhoods want to the higher ups. And I kind of blame the lack of material specificity for that, in part. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, this. Uh I would rather have the speakers um, speak, right? So we can always have this conversation. Um, um, but my sense is that this is uh, largely a missed opportunity um, in terms that one would have imagined a much more progressive administration um, uh, from, from, the, from the mayor who's about to step down. Um, uh, and that sort of goes to the question of the larger, right? Should it have come from top down or what, should it be coming from grassroots? And that's my. That's, that's, that's my concern here, because historically we know cities are built incrementally by a large number of people and actors. It's not only the designers who do it, it's, it's, a, it's hundreds of actors over large periods of time that sort of put together cities. Uh, the top down makes sense, it's quick, it's easy, the grand booba says this is the road we follow, and historically that's what humans have done. So um, that didn't happen apparently in, in this case. Um, you had a question? I think it was actually, uh, answered in the first question and then that part of the discussion. But one thing that kind of stood out to me is this uh, kind of very clear statement that urban design is more closely related to planning than, than architecture. As a formally trained architect, I, I don't take issue with it. I, I actually agree with the statement. Um, but I, I do, I, I was kind of hoping for your both of your reactions uh, to the idea that those skills actually uh, can be conducive to good urban design in terms of architecture being an iterative process um, and the kind of um, application of the design process to thinking about cities or its systems, essentially. Sure. We had a hand back there, so I'll be next to you. You had a question? <laughs> yes. Um, uh, shift to a different part of the world, uh, other side of the world. Um, there's a great arc of growth from Africa, to the Middle East, South Asia, to Southeast Asia. It's where most of the world's population is going to increase in the next quarter century, <clears throat> adding something like two billion people in that massive region. Um, that's like a city of one million people every year for the next 30 years. I forget the figures, but I, you probably all heard these figures bandied about. Um, is there any way 
good urban design can be automated or systematized? Can this become more of a, uh, uh, <clears throat> a scientific discipline that planners can apply to accommodate this growth and provide good urban design for these people who haven't been born yet? <laughs> uh, there's so many aspects to what you said. It sounds like a simple question, but it's actually quite complicated. Uh, I'm going to put my cards on the table. I think we're very careful about population projections. Uh, they are rarely accurate. Uh, sometimes they're alarmist. There's a whole politics of population projection, how people talk about certain populations growing, but they don't talk about other populations growing. I mean, do you know that uh, a lot of European countries are giving incentives to native-born people to have more kids? They want population growth, so I think we have to be a little careful about which populations we're talking about and why. There's been a long history of that. We need data, first of all, even the data itself, if you look at past trends. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, but I agree with your fundamental premise that we do have to think of the future population growth, but again, if you look at, it's not always linear, it doesn't mean it's going to keep growing indefinitely. Um, the other thing I'm always amazed at, some of my favorite cities in the world are some of the biggest, like Mexico City, and I actually wrote my first book about Mexico City, and one of the reasons is, all the narratives about Mexico City are about disaster. Such an awful place, traffic, crime, pollution, and I had a very simple question in my head. If it's such an awful place, it's such a hellhole, why do keep people keep moving there? And the answer is, it is not such a hellhole. It's a particular narrative. Yes, there are real problems, like Chicago has real problems, uh, cities have real problems. But there are also amazing neighborhoods, people doing amazing things. They get opportunities in Mexico City they would not get in the rural areas, economic opportunities, etc. What I'm trying to say is sometimes it's amazing what people can do. I think cities are amazing things. Uh, you know, as urban designers, we look at problems to fix. That's another approach, you know, from Charlie's point. I think we have to think beyond just problems to fix. But look at what great things are being done by in an unexpected place and build on them also. It's, you know, I call it, uh, People call it asset-based community development, ABCD. I call it asset-based community design. It's not just saying what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, let's fix it, we are experts. But what are great things they're doing at the local neighborhood level. So I think some of the answers are already in the cities. We don't have to fly in and do a little science of it. Uh, but the other premise I do agree with, uh, one is about we have to think of the future and what might happen, uh, and uh, that's exciting. The other thing is you know, we do have to think about issues of scale. Because we have a scale of cities we've never had in history before. Actually, the largest city, there are different definitions, but according to the United Nations, the latest statistics, the largest city in the world is actually Tokyo. You know, of course, they, when, when these days when we say city, we mean the metropolitan region, of course, because they're intertwined. And it has a population of 37 million people. If you start to think about it, you probably faint. But at some level, it works. So uh, I think there are certain uh, things that we know, you know, kind of breaking up cities into smaller. Uh, I live like uh, I lived in Los Angeles for a while, and people think that's an awful city. It's an awful city. I think it's actually a kind of city of the future. For example, we need more polycentric cities, not just downtown and suburbs, but with multiple centers. How do you break down, make it more manageable, make it more human scale? So there are certain principles that will help us deal with that. Uh, there are systems like you know, infrastructure systems which are like sewage, which are you know, over a century old, those have to be replaced. But I think if you look at not just large scale regional, but kind of more aggregations, uh, I think the future is not really, I think the future is really urban regions. Uh, so when, when I say cities, it's, which is kind of an agglomeration of different uh, scaled, I don't know what you call them, neighborhood cities, etc. So I know this is an answer to your question, but I'm a little, 
as you can tell from uh, my practice experience especially, yes, there are some things we do know, but I think we should not rush into one size fits all formula. That's my caution about that. There's a question. Yeah. MJ? I'm glad you brought up technology. Um, I don't have a lot of faith in technological approaches to urban design. Um, I think that, so we take automated vehicles, uh, big thing right now, very scary to me. The idea that technological advances like automated cars, having better batteries, having cars with no pollution at all, um, solar powered or whatever, I think all of that's fine on one level, but to design cities in function of that automation is where we got into trouble a lot uh, mid 20th century on. And uh, if we continue to design cities not in function of just the walking human body um, or the bicycling human body or the wheeling human body, um, non-technological, um, then I think we get into trouble get into trouble. Um, and one point on the um, automated vehicles, it doesn't do anything about congestion. Uh, you still have lots of cars, putting more and more cars on the road. Um, so what I want are cities that are walkable. It's just so, so basic and fundamental. And um, if automation and technological advance helps in some way to make cities more walkable, um, Sure, bring it on, but I'm, I'm very leery of the conversations I hear now about um, these fantastical urban designs that where drones are dropping in things and people are living on big suburban land, you know, in big suburban houses and drones are coming in and um, they're all in their automated vehicles. To me, that's a nightmare. Yeah, I completely agree with Emily that uh, it's not technology that changes society, it's how we apply technology. The conversation about technology, let's not forget two things. First of all, we create technology, it's not just something that comes out of our space, and we decide how to apply it. And there's some amazing technologies like in the medical sphere, in scientific, um, but I don't, yeah, these technologies that they're talking about in the city. I'm also very skeptical. It's very interesting. There's this very well-known uh, former chief planner of Vancouver, Brent Jodarian, who's a private consultant travels around the world. And you know, like we have our differences, we debate things. But there's one thing I completely agree with him, and I think Emily also said it. If there's one thing, if someone were to ask me, and again, I'm, I'm contradicting myself, I'm being overly simplistic, but <laughs> tell you why. Okay. If there's one thing we can do to really transform our cities is to make, it, make them walkable. And I thought about it because it sounds like an empty platitude, and I hate empty platitudes. But there are so many social, economic, and political ramifications of that. If you start thinking about it, break it down, I can give you 20 reasons if you have more time. Why making like Chicago or any other city much more walkable would be much more powerful than uh, you know, self-driving cars, any of the other flying cars or you know, drones and everything that people are excited about. And it will benefit many more people. It will make a city fundamentally much better than that. So, yeah, sometimes it is the, as I showed in my presentation, sometimes it's the non-sexy technologies. But technology comes from the word technique. It's a technique, it's a tool. And so it's up to us how we use it and apply it. And I think so there are those technologies of making the city more walkable that excite me much more than these other technologies. All right. Thank you, Asim and Emily. This was great to sort of hear your views about the role of design in shaping, shaping future cities. Uh, I want to invite uh, the Mike Pagano to say thanks and invite you to the reception where we can carry on some of these conversations. Uh, first of all, this is the inaugural event for the new Masters in City Design. It will be approved in December, so we're still at the pre-inaugural um, era, but uh, it's going to happen. And I want to thank the hard work that Sanjeev in particular did and his colleagues in urban planning to get this through a very, um, I would say, complicated political system. 
one of the, I, I learned a lesson in an earlier meeting with uh, Sanjeev that one, what you do in planning is you are good politicians. You know how to pull things together so that they work. Um, Sanjeev is a master at it. This was a very, diffi very difficult for the architecture school to give up the term design to urban planning. And I think uh, Sanjeev, uh, Phil Ashton, and uh, uh, Azuriza, and there were a few others, but I think th those three made the very strong case to our uh, colleagues in the School of Architecture. And it went through the um, uh, approval, and the Board of uh, Trustees has approved it. And now we're waiting for the Illinois Board of Higher Education so that next year at this time, there will be classes, there will be studios held in this building on the sixth floor. The sixth floor part of it will be turned into studio space. The construction on it will take place sometime around January or so, will be completed, we hope, by the end of spring, God willing. And the, and the other thing I want to announce is that uh, there's also support from the university and the college. The university gave the college one free, we didn't have to pay for it, one free assistant professor. The search for an assistant professor in city design is underway right now. So there's actually going to be another staff person in the form of a faculty member to come uh, uh, next fall and join all of you who are interested in this Masters of City Design. So. Those of you who are mops and are wondering, what do you do after you finish? <laughs> There's another degree that only takes one year to get through. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are food and beverages over there. Uh, uh, congratulations to everyone. Thank you for this wonderful panel. This is a great kickoff event for what amounts to city design. Thank you. My name is Asim Inam. I am a professor and chair in urban design at Cardiff University in the UK. I'm also the director of True Lab, the laboratory for designing urban transformation. I'm very happy to be here in Chicago. Very excited to be invited for the launch of the Master of City Design program. This is a wonderful time to go into city design, to be a city designer. Cities are more important than ever. There's a lot of interest in city design, and our understanding of city design is improving all the time. We are. We have new knowledge, new research, new ways of designing cities. And so I think this is a very promising start uh, at the University of Illinois in Chicago, which is a great city and a region. There's a lot to be learned here. Uh, Chicago is like a laboratory to work with communities, with neighborhoods, and to try out ideas, to learn from actual projects, to work with uh, community leaders, activists, and uh, urban uh, city design practitioners. So I wish uh, the program, the MCD, all the best and look forward to hearing more about it. Perfect. Hi, I'm Emily Tallon. I'm a professor of urbanism at the University of Chicago, here in Chicago. And uh, my research is about um, social equity and urban design and built environment. And I do a lot of um, writing about new urbanism, walkable cities. I'm really excited to be part of the new UIC Masters in City Design, which is going to be the only urban design program in the entire city of Chicago. So I really wish it well, and I think it's gonna be great.